You can be seated. Amen. We thank God for the praise team and their heart and what they do. I am uh, very excited this morning about his word. Amen. His word. You know, I believe, you're looking at a preacher that still believes that the Bible is God's word. Every line, every word. Amen. All 66 books, 39 old, 27 new, right? All 1,189 chapters, all 31,127 verses. And depending on what translation you have, over 700,018, 32, 36 words. I'm close. Every word is his word. You believe that? Now, when it comes to the word, shout word. Word. The word, word, (laughs) W-R-D, in the Bible, you have two Greek words there. Number one, you have logos, shout logos. Logos. Number two, you have rhema, shout rhema. rhema. Logos and rhema. Now, there's a difference between those two. And we're going to discuss that this morning, but there's a difference there. And I want you to understand that difference, all right? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, let's turn there in your Bible. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You know what? I'm, I'm looking forward to next Sunday morning when we start praying in this altar. I told them Wednesday night, you know what I'm going to start doing? I'm going to start scaring people away. That's right. I'm not wearing a salesman suit to try to get people to come to church. Not what I'm doing. I, we're going to try to scare people away. When they walk in here and they see us praying in the Holy Ghost and, and believe in God for great things, I want them to either marvel and say, wow, I want to be part of this, or I want them to say, these people are full of new wine. I'm getting out of here. Because that's what they did on the day of Pentecost, right? Some of them marveled at the wondrous works of God, how they were speaking the wonderful works of God. And then others said, they're full of new wine. They've lost their mind. And that's all right. Amen. Because I'm not ashamed this morning to call myself a Pentecostal preacher. Amen. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit are still operating today. I still believe God heals the sick. And I still believe that there is nothing impossible with God. And if we would just dare to believe him, he could do anything. You believe that? That's about eight of you. Amen. Ten. All right. (laughs) Praise God. I believe it today. Amen. I believe it today. All right. First Peter. Let's look at chapter one. And let's look at verse 23. Peter saying, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Now, you have to think about Peter here. Peter walked with Christ as Christ began to teach, as Christ looked at him and said, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. Going back to God, when he created the heavens and the earth, he did it by speaking, right? He said, let there be light, and light was, right? And, and, and he said, uh, you know, uh, let the waters divide from the land, and, and let there be a firmament, and he called it good. Uh, and then when he created man, of course, he took a hands-on approach. But, but the Bible says that he took, he took nothing and created something. Hebrews 1, or 11, verse 3, right? Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, the word of God, right? They were framed, they were built, they were carved out by the word of God. The things which are seen were not made by things which do appear. So he took nothing and he made it something. Amen. Amen. But you see, when he created man, the Bible says, imagio Dei in the Hebrew, that's a reflection. In other words, we are a reflection of God, which means we operate by the stimuli of God, right? So in other words, as a born-again believer, if you are born again, when, when tragedy hits your life, your reaction should be a stimuli to his word. Not calling your friends, right? 
uh, uh, but, or not looking on Facebook or, or WebMD to see how bad things really are, right? Your, your, your response should be to the stimuli of his word. That's what you should respond to because you're created in his image. That's a Maggio Dei, that stimuli, that response to God. Amen. As Pastor taught last Sunday, we are created to be addicted to his presence, addicted to his word. We're created to respond to him in such a way. Amen. Peter said, being born again, not of incorruptible seed. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the, shout it, the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. In other words, when you're born into this earth, when your mother gives birth to you, that's corruptible seed. When when a man's seed hits a woman's womb and a baby is created, that's a corruptible seed. You are born knowing how to sin. Nobody ever taught you how to lie. Nobody ever taught you how to manipulate. In fact, you could come up with some of the scariest things you could do to people, how you can manipulate them, how you can steal, how you can cheat on your time card at work, how you can cheat on your taxes. You can come up with all kinds of ways to do that. Nobody had to teach you that. It's automatically ingrained within you as a corruptible seed. And you can see it in children very young. You can. They didn't have to go to a seminar to learn how to lie right? They just know. Corruptible seed, right? Corruptible seed. That's what it is. Uh, But Peter, he says, when you're born again, as Jesus taught Nicodemus, you must be born again before you can see the kingdom of God. In other words, you must have a regeneration within you. In other words, the, the seed of his word has to hit your dead spirit so that you can come alive. Amen? Amen. By the word, shout word. Word Word in verse 23 is logos. All right, now I want you to pay attention here. Logos is the expression of God. So the Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14 of John 1, and the word became flesh. Who was the word? Christ. But if you read it like that, it's almost like he created Jesus. But he didn't create Jesus. Jesus. See, in the beginning was the word. Logos means an expression. He is the, Jesus is the expression of God. So on day one, when he said, let there be light, and he divided the light from the darkness, he hadn't created the sun, moon, or stars yet. That wasn't created till day four. So what was that light? That light was his expression, his logos, who he was. He was revealing who he was, and he was separating that light from darkness. See, That's the Logos. In the beginning was the Word. That's what Peter's talking about right here. Born again of incorruptible seed by the Word of God, the expression of God. That thing that you hold in your hand right now, that is a Logos. That Bible is a Logos. That's the expression of God. You never need a new word. You never need a new prophecy or a new revelation that contradicts that book. If it contradicts that book, they're a false prophet. Anything anybody ever prophesies over you or speaks into your life, it better line up with God's word. And if it doesn't in one single area, they are a false prophet. He does not need to add nor take away from his word. The Bible is still God's word. Shout Logos. The Logos is still God's word. Amen. I like what Joshua 1 verse 8 says. It says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. I like what David said in Psalm 1 verses 1 and 2. He said, blessed, shout I'm blessed. He said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I like what the psalmist said in Psalm 119 in verse 11. He said thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and he said I've taken that word and I've hid it in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I like what Solomon said in all of his wisdom in Proverbs 30 verses 5 and 6. He said every word of God is pure and it is a shield to 
them that trust in it. Do not add to his word, lest he rebuke you and you be found as a liar. I like what Jesus said in John 6, 63. He says, my word is spirit and life. I like what he said in John 10, 35. He said, the scripture cannot be broken. I like what Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and 15. He said, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I like what he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. He said, preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will after their own lust heap under themselves teachers having itching ears and turning their ears away from the truth of God's word. I like what he told him in 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man or the woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. I like what Peter said in 2 Peter verses 1 and 21 he said the prophecy of old time came not by the will of men but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost hallelujah what you hold in your hand is not man's writings it's not man's thoughts it's not man's ideas or man's opinions but it is still today the oak of God planted in the forest of eternity and it is God's word the logos the expression of who God is I like what the writer of Hebrews Hebrews said in Hebrews 1 and verse 3, he said that Christ was the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. In Hebrews 4 and verse 12, he said the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There's never been a surgeon who could take a scalpel and cut through the secrets of my heart and my mind but I promise you when you begin to read God's word he can get right down to the core of who you are not only does it reveal how bad and ugly you are but it has the power to change your life and regenerate your spirit and make you a new creation by his word now you ain't gonna hear nothing better than that anywhere today Uh, I see a Pentecostal church today that lacks power. You've got more perversion than power. You've got more playboys than prophets. And you've got more counsel than conviction. All these sermons I hear, it's like a counseling session. Nothing against counseling, but give me some word. Amen. Give me something that's going to change my life. Amen. 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 Jesus said in Luke 22, verse 33, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand forever. The grass is going to wither. The flower is going to fade away. But God's word will still be here in the end. Aren't you thankful for that? Let's continue. I've got so much I want to share with you. Amen. Verse 24. All flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is as flower of grass. And the grass withereth and the flower fades away. But the word shout word. Now he changes positions here. It's no longer logos. He says, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. He transitions from logos to rhema. Now, rhema is a little bit different than logos. If I'm struggling and I'm having a hard time, I can open up the logos but I can get a rhema. A rhema 
is a right now, instant, in season, word from God. You know, there's some scriptures, they don't mean anything to you until you walk through it. And when you're walking through that valley and that verse becomes alive to you, that's a rhema, see? But how can you ever know what a rhema is unless you need one? Everybody wants to see miracles, but nobody ever wants to be in the position to receive one. Right? So Peter transitions. He goes from logos, and then he starts talking about the gospel, which brought salvation. And he said, that is a rhema. Shout rhema. That's a fresh word from God. When I stand up here or pastor stands up here and it hits you right dead in your spirit, man, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. That's not us. That's not me. That's the spirit of God giving you a rhema right there. I've had people tell me all the time, almost weekly, brother, I loved it when you said such and such. And I go back in my memory bank and I'll watch the tape and I'll say, I never said that. But you know what? They heard that, and that's all right, because the Spirit of God can take his word, and he can twist it any way he wants to, to hit your spirit, man. That's a rhema. Amen. That takes a lot of pressure off of me, because I, I, I've preached under the anointing, and I've preached without it. And even when I preached without it, God still healed people. Amen. Because it had nothing to do with my word. It was his rhema. I was just expressing the logos. Amen. But he gave the rhema. He, he put that word in your spirit to cause it to come alive. Hallelujah. You want to learn some more about this? All right, go to Luke. Let's talk about Christmas. Honey, could you open up that bottle? Amen. I'm so dehydrated. Thank you. Thank you. Luke's gospel. Let's look at chapter 1. In Luke's gospel, we have two people who receive a rhema. And I want us to see how they react to it. I want to see what their reaction is. And I want you to compare it to your life today. We have Zacharias, who was whom? He was the father of John the Baptist. His wife was Elizabeth. And Zacharias was a priest. And he was in the temple of God, performing his duties. And as he was in the temple of God, performing his duties, the Bible says in Luke 1 that an angel of the Lord appeared and stood at the right hand of the altar. But what was Zacharias doing? He was offering incense from the altar of incense of the tabernacle. Now, there's some significance there because the altar of incense represents the prayers of Israel. Yes. So as that incense goes over the veil into the Holy of Holies, that represents the prayers of the people going into the throne room of heaven. Now for you and I under the new covenant, that's praying in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Do you pray in the spirit? Amen. Well, you should if you don't. That's how you build up your most holy faith, Jude 20. Amen. Amen. But, but praying in the spirit, the, 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 the incense, the, the aroma going into the presence of God. Let's read Luke 1, and let's pick up at verse, uh, let's look at verse 5. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judah a certain priest named Zacharias. Of course, of Abbei, his wife was Elizabeth. And let's look at verse 7. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken and years. So Elizabeth needed a rhema. She needed a word from God. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. Verse 7. All right, look at verse 8. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense. I told you that. He was representing the prayers of Israel. All right, And the whole multitude, verse 10, of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. (sighs) 
You know what? Your faith reveals your language. No, your language reveals your faith. I can tell you where your faith is by listening to you talk. I can. And I won't be around you long if that faith isn't high. Because I can tell you where your faith is because when you're talking, it's all negative. It's all about how you don't know how it's going to work out and how, how hopeless the situation seems and how, how you just don't know how it's going to get any better. Hopeless. Zacharias was praying for this. And then he got his answer, his rhema. And what did he do? He says, how can this happen? Elizabeth's aging. So am I. And what did Gabriel do to him? He shut his mouth. And he says, you won't be able to speak until the word is fulfilled in its season. Think about that. So he was praying, and God answered his prayer, and he complains about it. That's so many of you right now. You've prayed for things, and you've, you've, you've asked God for answers. You've asked him for direction, and he's giving you an answer, but you just don't like the answer. And he's giving you exactly what you pray for. He's giving you direction. He's giving you the words. He's giving you the rhema. He's giving you the instruction. But it's not quite like the way you wanted it, so you don't accept that. Well, what's going to happen is your language is going to begin to reveal that. And the Bible says that man eats good by the fruit of his mouth. So whatever you're saying, that's going to be the fruit of your life. Amen? So Zacharias, he gets a rhema, he gets a word from God. He gets his answer, right? And he reacts in such a way of unbelief. Boggles my mind. The angel of the Lord shows up to him. And he's startled. Because Jewish tradition says that only God would stand on the right side of that altar. But here he sees Gabriel standing there. And the people are outside praying, <laughs> interceding with him. Just like you've got people praying with you and for you. And you get an answer. And the first words out of your mouth is, well, how can that happen? I just don't know. Amen. All right. Flip over. No, look at verse 19. So he tells him that he's going to have a son. His name's going to be John. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And verse 20, And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. Can I tell you something? That you have a rhema from God, a word from God, a direction from God that will be fulfilled in its season. This may not be the season, but it could be tomorrow, could be next week, could be next year. Are you willing to wait on that season? All right, flip over one page. Go to verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, and the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now, that, that would be a wonderful rhema right there, wouldn't it? Because if God showed up and he says, you're highly favored, you're blessed, and the world will call you blessed. And they're going to read about you 2,000 years from now. And there's going to be a sect of religion that worships you. You'd think Mary would feel pretty good, right? She was highly favored. But I want you to say this with me. Favor, Favor. ain't Favor. Fair. fair. I know it isn't for the right way, but I'm just saying. Favor ain't fair. I want you to remember that. Fa say it again. Favor ain't fair. She was favored, but she was going to have to tell her husband she was pregnant who she hasn't married yet. 
She was going to have to tell her family that. She was going to have to tell the community that. When they started seeing that baby bump and she hadn't got married yet, what do you think they was going to do to her? Oh, but yet she was favored. She was going to have to flee the country because somebody was out to kill her child. Oh, but she's favored. Highly favored. Favor is not fair. But she receives a rhema word from God. She has been given the logos, the seed of God, which is God's son, Jesus Christ, birthed on the inside of her. How does she receive that rhema? Here's how she receives it. Let's read. I want to read it to you. Amen. Verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name, shouted at me, Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now, here's the difference between Mary and John. Because they both questioned it. But why was Mary blessed and John wasn't? I'm sorry, what I say? John, Zacharias. Why was Zacharias rebuked and Mary wasn't? Because, hold on a minute, because Zacharias was praying and asking for it. Mary had no idea. She's going about her business, and all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord shows up to her and says, you're going to bear the Son of God. When, you read, when your daddy read Isaiah 7, 14 to you, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, being God with us, you didn't know that was talking about you. Whew. You see what I'm saying here? She received a rhema a word from God that, that would absolutely change her life. Amen. And the angel says, you are highly favored among women. She's now giving, going to be giving birth to the Logos, the seed of God, Jesus Christ. Verse 35. Oh, God. Now, I, as we read these next few verses, I want you to see what I'm preaching this morning. I want you to see the power of God's word. I want you to see the power of a rhema. Amen. A right now, in season, word from God. Because I believe that God, Christ the Holy Ghost, he knew there would come a day when people would say, the virgin birth is impossible. It could not happen, and it did not happen. It's biologically impossible. It's biologically incorrect. But then in verse 35, the angel said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. That holy thing that is born unto thee shall be called the Son of God. And you go to verse 37, I had quoted that verse and read it so many times, but I've never seen it quite in this context before. I believe God knew there would come a day that people would say it's biologically impossible, biologically incorrect, and you know what? I agree with both of those. I believe it just cannot happen, but with God. God, but with God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. And when you get a rhema word from God, a right now in season word, if you're sick in your body, you can trust the rhema that by his stripes you are healed. If you have disturbing news in your life, you can trust the rhema word that says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And the same Holy Ghost that touched the dead wound of Mary and put the Logos in her belly is the same Holy Ghost that calls you to the foot of the cross and when he calls you to the foot of the cross the word of God is impregnated on your dead spirit and Jesus Christ is now in you the Holy Ghost you hear what I'm telling you you give birth to this thing you see yeah. what happens when you're born again uh -huh. the Logos the seed of his word gives birth to Christ in you. That's right. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, let's keep reading. Hallelujah. Look at verse 
38. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. <laughs> now I want you to notice what she didn't say before we read what she did say. She didn't say, I don't accept this situation. I declare by faith it ain't going to happen. I'm going to put the verse on my refrigerator. I'm going to put it on my mirror that says I don't have to accept this. I'm going to be wealthy, prosperous, and I won't be sick ever. Is that what she said? What did she say? She said, be it unto me according to thy. But you have to study that out. Is she saying logos or rhema? She says, be it unto me according to thy rhema. <laughs> be it unto me according to thy rhema. <clears throat> Sometimes your rhema is going to be, he has healed you of all your diseases. And then sometimes your rhema is going to be, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Sometimes your rhema is going to be, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. And then sometimes your rhema is going to be, for it is given unto me on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on his name, but also to suffer. For his sake. But in the end, God's word will be true in your life. You believe it? Go to verse 41. She goes to see Elizabeth. She's excited and scared all at the same time. And it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary. She's already six months pregnant. The babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. That is the key, my friend. You hear what I'm telling you? The Bible says, be not drunk with wine where it is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You know what that means? When you were, when you were drunk and broke, busted, and disgusted, people would get around you and they'd say, you know what? That's just the liquor talking. That's the beer talking. Anybody ever said that about you? You start talking louder and getting meaner and uglier and all that. You know, they said, that's just the alcohol talking. Well, Paul's saying, you know what? When you get filled with the Holy Ghost and people get around you, they're just going to say, you know what? He's positive and he's declaring God's word. That's just the Holy Ghost talking in him. Because when, when she heard that word, that rhema from Mary, the babe leaped on the inside of her and she was filled with the Holy Ghost. But it was prophesied that John would be filled with the Holy Ghost from his birth and he would go into hiding, praying and fasting most of his life. 30 years later, he comes on the scene and he's eating, uh, you know, uh, 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 insects and wild, he's got wild honey on his belt and he looks crazy, his hair's long and, he's, and then they think he's nuts. I'm telling you, I'm at a point right now, I don't care what this world thinks about me. Amen. I'm going to shout, I'm going to dance, and I'm going to believe God for big things. Yes, amen. And I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. amen. I want this, this is, as long as I'm a pastor here, this will be a Pentecostal church. Amen. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I believe with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. I still believe that those who are baptized with the Holy, Holy Ghost talk in tongues, pray in tongues, and believe God for great and mighty things. I still believe that. Amen. I still believe that. And I still believe a rhema word can pop up in your spirit at any moment. Dear God. How can one pop up in your spirit unless it's there to begin with? Right. That's right. The reason many of you don't get a rhema word from God when you need it is because you haven't put anything in there. The Bible says he will bring all things to your remembrance, whatever he said unto you. But you know what? He's not going to bring anything to your remembrance you've never put in there before. Right. Yes. Amen. All right. I'm just having fun. You can leave whenever you want to. I'm going to preach a while. Uh, verse 46. Mary said, My soul <clears throat> doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Hallelujah. For he hath regarded the lowest state of this handmaiden. 
For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Hallelujah. Go to Acts 27. I think that's where it is. Acts 27. I just got a rhema. You ready for it? I did just now. That's what I'm telling you. If you get in God's word, he will bring things to your remembrance. This is for somebody right here. Acts 27. I think. If it's a rhema, it better be, right? Acts 27. Yep. I was right. He's right. Amen. (laughs) Praise God. Isn't it good to have fun? Studying God's word. We don't have no... I don't have a sermon outline. I just don't have... I, I just don't do them anymore because... I always get tied to it, and I always get frustrated because I don't cover something, and I said, just forget it. Amen. I feel better when I don't have one. Amen. I know I sh- shoot with a sawed-off shotgun, and I go in a bunch of different directions, but you just receive it anyway. Amen. It's more fun that way. All right. Praise God. I told them Wednesday night, somebody told me one time, they said, are you one of those faith prosperity preachers? I said, well, I'm not a doubt, unbelieving preacher, if that's what you're saying. <laughs> A doubt, unbelieving, poverty preacher. I'm not one of those. All right. Shout rhema. Rhema. Paul got a rhema. He knew what a rhema was. Because in Ephesians 6, verse 17, he said, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word, the rhema of God. Not logos, the rhema of God. An in-season right now word. From God. All right, he receives one. All right, let's look. <clears throat> so I want to give you the overview of this chapter. Paul is heading toward Rome, and he's doing it by ship. Amen? He's tried everything else. You ever seen planes, trains, and automobiles? Who's ever seen that? Boy, they just could not get to where they were going, could they? I mean, the plane didn't. Only three people have seen that movie in this place. <laughs> Don't worry, we're not going to get in trouble. Who's seen it? Planes, trains, and automobiles. There we go. All right. Praise God. <laughs> they, couldn't, they just couldn't get anywhere. The plane didn't, it wasn't right. You know, the train blew up. Remember, they had to get out and walk, right? Their car caught on fire. But finally, he got home, didn't he? Yeah. Amen. Anyway, this is kind of the position Paul's in. So he's going by ship, and he's a little anxious about it. In fact, he tells them, he says, I don't think we should do this. In Acts 27, he says, if we go, he's already been released from jail. He's, he's been on trial. He stood before every Roman governor and every religious leader there is. And he's played his Roman citizen card. And he says, I'm a Roman citizen. You got to let me go. And he was a Roman citizen, technically. But he was also a Jew. <laughs> but he was, you know, Paul was slick. He was slick. He, he knew how to get things done. And he did. And, but he told him, he says, guys, I just don't feel good about it. I feel like we're going to suffer loss. Well, they said, ah, we'll be all right. Somebody always knows better, don't they? And uh, so they start sailing, and they hit a few bumps in the road. A storm, storm comes up, heavy storm, for days. And they began throwing stuff out of the ship, you know, uh, making the weight lighter so they don't go under. They, you know, they began doing all these things, and, and, and they're concerned and worried that there's going to be loss of life. And I want to look at verse Let's jump down to verse uh, 22. Let's look at verse 20, verse 20 of Acts 27. <clears throat> and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a spot where you had lost all hope for things to get any better? Have you ever lost all hope that it would just never go away, whatever it is, and that it would never change? But aren't you glad that when your faith is anchored in the Logos, there's always a rhema. There's always a word from God to give you hope from the incorruptible seed of his word, God in heaven. All right, so they lost all hope. 
Verse 21, but after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and he said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, you should have listened to me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. Verse 22, I love this. <laughs> and now I exhort you to be of good cheer. In other words, he says, just smile. Cheer up in the middle of this storm, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. In other words, it's going to get bad, and we're going to lose some things, and this ship's going to be destroyed, but you and I will be saved. So in other words, the promise that Paul had from God, that rhema word, he didn't predicate that on his circumstances. He knew things would probably get worse, but when it was all said and done, he wins. You follow what I'm saying? His circumstances did not determine the value of that rhema word that he received from God because he knew God's word is true. All right. Amen. Verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am. Hallelujah. I love that. And whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. That's his rhema right there. Hallelujah. And Paul is just declaring the promise of God. That's what he's doing. Can I, te can I teach you something? You ready? The word of God will always override the facts of your life. Write that down. The word of God will always override the facts of your life. The fact is you got a bad report at the doctor. Don't deny it. It's true. That's a fact. But the truth of God's word is always overriding the facts of your life. Because there's a higher truth in the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Medley, when they told you you had something on your lungs, that was a fact. But the truth of God's word was by his stripes, you are healed. And my God, if you would just dare to believe something like that, his word can be performed in your life. Because Isaiah the prophet said that the word of God does not return void. That if he sends it somewhere, and if you receive it, and you hold to it by faith, it will not return empty. It will fulfill what it has been set out to do. You believe that? Shout yes. yes. Hallelujah. Paul received a word from God. And he's declaring that word. Oh. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God. For I believe God. Not my circumstances, not the wind, not the rain, not the tumultuous storm. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. What has he told you? What has he promised you? Well, look into his word and find it. Amen. I believe that in the last days, I told him Wednesday night, you know, we've got, we've got these Christian artists out here, these singers who are talking about the kingdom of God and how we're going to invade politics and business and education will not happen. My Bible still says that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. Jesus said in the last days there would be wars and rumors of wars. He said there would be earthquakes in divers places. Do you see what happened to Alaska just the other day? That earthquake that struck that place. Every time I see something like that, my spirit man begins to rejoice because it confirms once again to me that God's word is true and that we can stand on that same word when he said heaven and earth will pass away. This earth will roll up like a glove, but God's word will stand forever. Amen. <sighs> Raise your hands and honor him for a minute. Hallelujah. I'm not in no hurry. If you've got to go, take off. Amen. Lord, we bless you in this place. We thank you for the rhema. Oh, God. So here's, right, everybody close your eyes, close your eyes, and, 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 and just shake your head back and forth. All right, now look at me, at you shaking off your ADHD, all right? You can start over now. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> About 15 minutes into it, some of you, you're just, 
You're looking to go to lunch, man. That's all right. Just shake it off. We're going to start over, all right? I get 15 more minutes. Praise God. Uh, I want you to hear what I'm preaching to you. Because what Peter declared in that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Understand that for you to be transformed, to be saved, to be born again, to become a new creation. And I'm trying to, you know, once again, this is the gospel. Uh, the gospel can't be explained in human terms. It can't be rationalized by your mind. It has to be the Holy Spirit implanting the word, the logos, the gospel, the rhema of the gospel into your spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. For you to come alive. That's the only way you can get it is by the Holy Ghost. That's it. That's the incorruptible seed of God's word. All right? So when that word hits your dead spirit, you become alive. Amen. Amen. I want you to get that this morning. And when it becomes alive, you now have Christ birthed on the inside of you, just like Mary had him birthed. <laughs> Christ is now birthed. Christ the Holy Ghost is birthed on the inside of you, and he's living in you, Amen. and he's living through you. Yes. Is he today? Is he living through you? Is he living in you? Are you truly born again? Listen, if you're in habitual sin, if you're in bondage, and, 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 and you're walking after the lust of the flesh, my Bible says that when you're a new creation, Amen. old things pass away, yes, and all things become new. You can be saved. You can be born again by the incorruptible seed. You can be changed. You're looking at a preacher that still believes in deliverance. I don't, I don't buy it for a minute. Once an addict, always an addict. I don't buy it. I've seen him set too many people free. I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it. You say, well, he won't do it for me. Well, maybe you ain't praying. Because your language is revealing your faith. You can't say, God, deliver me. Thank you for delivering me. And then go call your drug dealer and say, leave me alone, I'm trying to quit. You think that's going to work? He's going to hit you harder. Amen. Amen. Let your faith, my God, hear me today. Yes. Don't let your mountain move your faith. Let your faith move your mountain today. Yes. What are you struggling with? Amen. What do you need from God? What kind of rhema do you need today? He's got it for you. Amen. And he's got it for this church. Amen. And it's just for you to be set free by God's power. Amen. Do you receive it today? Yes. Hold up your logos. Hold it up. And say, Lord, thank you for the logos. And thank you for the rhema. I want it. I need it. I desire it. I crave it. I hunger for it. I thirst for it. And I receive it today by faith. Praise God. Stand with me, if you would. If you're watching by camera, listening by podcast, this incorruptible seed of God's word is for you today. Simply by faith, receive the gospel. Confess your sin. Accept Jesus Christ into your heart by faith by simply saying that you believe that God raised him from the dead. And confess with your mouth, believe with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. I want to pray for you right now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, give you peace, and anoint you in these last days. God bless you. Thank you for watching and listening.